about to follow everything I believe in. Now I He's mighty to save, He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Shine the light out, let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Shine your light out, let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Lord God, I want to thank you for the opportunity this morning to surrender. I want to ask of you to lead us with your spirit so that we would firstly and foremost seek out your cross as the first marker of our identity, but then also as a first marker of our reality in today. Lord, ultimately you are in control of the universe. You are mighty to save. You are um, the only able God that we know and therefore we pray this in your name. Amen. I want to greet then all of you in the beautiful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. So uh, I want to start this week's sermon by referring to a few conversations that I had in the week. And what struck me in uh, these conversations was that I'm, I was constantly kind of confronted by how many times uh, we speak about uncertainty and about fear uh, on the one hand, but then on the other hand, there was this almost automatic response after this time of uh, panic globally or, you know, just in your own kind of random situation at home, where, where I find that hope in a way slips into the conversations very naturally, almost. It's as if... Um, People adapted so well to this new normal, or busy adapting, that we can, in a way, um, continue. It's almost as if we start to tell the stories of fun or celebrating stuff uh, as the re news reporter is sitting in a room and a child gets onto a lap and asks, Mommy, who's that person? You know, it's, it's as if the joy and the peace and kind of something of the hopefulness of God prevails in our matter. I think the truth is that um, when we think back on stages in our lives where we experienced fear, where we have experienced something as frightening as a, well, not just as the pandemic, but, you know, like really uh, tangible experiences that you maybe had as, as a kid, um, the truth is that that fear can control us. And... I think we saw actually a lot of that happening um, in our country in the past, obviously. So uh, I don't think it's a new thing in today's uh, situation. I think fear has always been part of the human story. Um, sometimes it moves us uh, to explore, moves us to you know get out of the way of things. Um, it makes us uh, search deeper and longer. So I don't think fear is in all circumstances a bad thing. But reality is, if you go, if you give over to fear <clears throat> in its totality, um, 
it will control you. I mean, we have experienced um, fear since childhood. And, and even when you speak to someone, um, you know, uh, in their old age, um, there's always something, you know, maybe a fear of, um, you know, well, not just uh, financial prov providence for your, for your children, but then just in general, um, the fear of losing relationships. And uh, I think in a way we confront something of that when we sing, when we confess, Lord, you are mighty to save. It is as if God has through the ages, you know, provided this back door or maybe the main front door out of our situations with fear. So just back to my remark on uh, the conversations. I think we, we constantly journey between fear and joy and, and desperation and hope and laughter and tears. Um, it's almost uh, as certain um, that they will change as today, you know, um, is just a prelude to tomorrow and tomorrow to the future. It's as if we are, in a way, um, caught in this flow between yesterday, today and tomorrow. And um, when I when I was preparing for this sermon, it, it made me think about the movie of Adam Sandler uh, in um, the movie's name is Click. And so what happens there is Adam gets this uh, universal remote that really can control everything. So um, he then actually, he actually figures it out how to skip all the bad stuff in his life, all the stuff that he finds boring, like, you know, getting dressed in the morning and tying his shoelaces and brushing his teeth. And then he ends up skipping forward over each and every instance where the tough gets going. You know, he skips the mundane kind of everyday, everyday things and, and he really just journey towards the nice and the easy. And um, eventually this remote, you know, uh, leads him to putting himself on autopilot. So he really just, you know, glides through life. And then um, we find him at the almost end of the movie where he, he kind of awakens and realized like that he have missed his whole life. He've missed the essence of the present moment, of the beauty in going through uh, the mundane or even even the difficult things in life. And so then his, um, his uh, realization is, I've messed things up. You know, if I just glide through this, if I just go on autopilot, I, I really miss um, the purpose of things. I think we get stuck in such places where we wish that everything that is currently will just pass. That we, in such a way, dream about the future or are just uh, apathetic towards where we are now that, really, that we re really miss um, today. Um, we, don't con we don't take control of our situation. We become so passive that we are really, um, you know, on autopilot, we we just float through things. It's as if we um, want we, we want to leave behind our responsibility to act uh, concisely in the year and the now. It's as if we just give over to my yesterday, determining my today, my past, determining my future, my my today, just flowing into tomorrow without me being present in that. And so I think we we tend to become people seemingly without choices, without hope, without a future. A future. And I think uh, in a way when, when we link up to the, to the text and we're going to go to that now, we become a society of sighing people where we find ourselves hopeless. Um, and I don't think it's just applicable to, you know, gl the global situation, but really in individual spaces. We are sometimes so bound up in our histories that we can't see any way forward for, uh, to, to our future. And I think it's in that, those spaces where we sometimes very concretely have to deal with maybe, for instance, rejection of a father, where for the rest of your life, that thing that happened in your past determines your future. For instance, that you will forever be seeking acceptance. Um, and the truth is, you know, we can break free from from stories like that, from our own history, by really embracing that space. 
So in short, if I can use the analogy of, of this click movie, uh, we need a pause button. We need times in our lives where we, ha where we uh, don't have a choice about pausing or stopping. We just should, you know, to make very um, informed choices about our future. And I think our text thing will help us, hopefully, with that. So let us read Romans 8, verse 15 to 25. The spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are years, years of God and co-years with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share, I mean, may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to, frust to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship. The, redemp the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. The whole creation is groaning, hoping for a better tomorrow, waiting patiently, not just creation, but Almost everything that we are and that we know, the whole universe, if you read in a way the other letters of Paul, he's got this, he, he's got this vision for a universal cosmic um, re reveal that really sets everything free. So last week's sermon, um, Marius started by talking or giving us an overview over, over Romans. And he touched on this, you know, cosmic a universal effect of sin and um, stipulating that everything and all um, is affected by this and so like he emphasized that your story and my story all aspects are are moved by this and I think that is the um, that is the fountain of the sigh it is why we sometimes get so uh, inundated by um, it is because of this that we get so overwhelmed by um, desperation that we sometimes find ourselves without hope and then um, you know I think we dream about a, a new reality we hope for it although we sometimes feel that it is a pie in the sky we we wish that there is an ultimate pause button and um the truth that we can embrace then today is, you know, that that Jesus Christ uh, provided us with with such a function. You know, as it were, he pushed the pause button on the continuation of processes and um, devastating uh, rhythms and desperation and fear and hopelessness and death um, when when he took up the cross, when he said that it is all done, that he was following um, the road that was pointed towards, uh, that, was, that was given to him by God himself. You see, so the cross um, really conquers all. Our salvation in Christ and the spirit that we have now, the spirit that Romans 8 speaks about, is a cross that trumps all. It says, I mean, if I take the parts out of the scripture um, that refers to this new life, it says we're God's children. We are co-heirs. 
we share in his glory we are eager in expectation we uh, then well nature is liberated from bondage and nature is brought into the freedom um, we wait for the redemption of our bodies and then verse 24 for in this hope we were saved he saves us from this from this every day uh, yesterday, today, tomorrow rhythm. He saves us from our own stories and he provides us with a new one. There's always a bigger story. And so I think it is out of this perspective of a Christ focus that we read chapter 7 um, from verse 24. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm, I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. I hope you hear something of the beauty of Christ and of this amazing saving grace that really transcends all and um, that heralds in new possibilities here and now. It is not just a dreaming game, but it is practical and it is here. The big question I think that we have to deal with then comes out of how Luther uh, named us. He said that we are justified sinners. In a way, uh, we are saved from this death cycle. We are justified. We are set free. But we are still sinners. We are justified sinners. We are still subjected to wrong decisions and to uh, imposing hurt and pain on others. We are still subjected to pain itself, to sighing, that sigh that we hear about. We are still subjected to death and to struggles. And so why do we then still struggle, although we are justified, set free? Uh, why are we still acting in a way as if we are slaves, but we know that we are not? Why do I find myself in situations where I struggle in this death cycle? Now, to help us with this uh, question, I want to bring in a theological construct with the name of the already and the not yet. And so there's a German theologian, Oscar Kuhlmann, that uh, actually coined this kind of explanation about the already and the not yet. So for a moment, just, just bear with me. When we talk about um, World War II, because that's the analogy that he uses, um, it is this devastating period in our history that really shaped how our world looks like and acts like today. It, was, it started in 1939 and ended in 1945. And um, so there's these two days that we refer to when we speak about the final um, culmination of victory um, in the Second World War story. So on the one hand, we have D-Day. So D-Day is the day that the Allied forces landed on the, the French beaches of Normandy. Uh, and they began the invasion of the northwestern part of, of Europe. And if you ask any historian, uh, they supposedly point towards D-Day as the starting point of the victory of the Allies over um, the German forces. And so in a way, when you look to D-Day, it is the day on which the beginning of victory was born. But the reality is that although D-Day may, may be here, uh, the rest of the war still continued. There was still, you know, uh, heavy fighting, famine, um, campaigns were lost and, and, and won by both sides of, of you know, the, the Allies and the, uh, the Germans. There was a great loss of lives, uh, deaths in the, in the 300 and 36 days between D-Day and V-Day, um, you know, hundreds and thousands of lives lost. I mean, obviously, the final push of the mass massacre of the Jews was in, in those days. And so, on the one hand, we have V-Day, 
the announcement almost, the, the heralding in of the victory, the, the happening almost of the, the breaking of, of the back of the enemy on D-Day. And then we have V-Day. And so V-Day stands for Victory Day. And it's marked by the 8th of May 1945. That was the day when um, the German forces surrendered, um, you know, unanimously, totally to, to the Allied forces. And, um, and so the question then most probably in your heart is how does this construct help us? Well, in a way, I think the theological construct of already and not yet is in a way... Um, you know, easily portrayable in speaking about D-Day and V-Day. Because the reality is on D-Day, on the day of the cross of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, uh, saying the words, that is full bring, um, that is our D-Day. And then the, the future that we know are coming as sure as dawn, that is V-Day. That is when the second coming of Christ is a reality. Everything in between signifies that we know that D-Day has happened. That the victory of Christ is real and that it is coming. That everything in between is really just the final fatal movements of the snake's head that's been cut off. The body is still wriggling. What's the word? Wriggling. Um, but we know that the battle has been won. On the cross, God defeated power, uh, the power of sin and of darkness. He, he's cut off the, the snake's head. And everything afterwards, this tension that we live in now, is really just the final squirmings of the body of the snake. And so, let's make it practical. This means that God has defeated sickness, although it might sound insensitive to you if I say that God has defeated COVID-19 or uh, MS or cancer or flu or HIV or hunger or um, the inflictment of massacres on, on a great lot of people. The truth is uh, God already defeated that. Unfortunately, we are subjected to to the wriggling of the body of the snake. But the truth is, we know D-Day happened and V-Day is around the corner. Now, the final destination then for us is not this in-between space. It is ultimately the day where we know that total victory will be ours. And I want you for a moment to, to hear that for your own pain and your own history, and your own losses, and your own battles. Today is a, is a new day. It is a day that, herald, that, that heralds in the coming of the kingdom of God. Don't be caught up um, in this normal autopilot flow. Don't be paralyzed by fear, because God has, a, has defeated it all. You can adapt your today and tomorrow does not need to be determined by your past. There is a new normal, not just in these times, but in the kingdom of God, there is hope and there is peace. And God is bringing that all. Verse 24 again, hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it. Patiently. I want to invite you to sigh, to sigh deeply, but not the, the, the sigh of defeat, but the sigh of intent, of knowing that we are in this final kind of um, tension, knowing that victory is ours. I want to invite you to plant the seeds uh, today so that we might taste the wheat um, in a few months' time. Invest your time and energy in stuff that's worthwhile. Live with hope now because V-Day is coming. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song of 
deliverance from my enemies until all my fears are gone. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear, and I am a child of God. chosen me love has called my name and I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins cause I'm no longer a slave to fear and I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear And I am a child of God I am surrounded By the songs of deliverance we've been liberated from our bondage we're the sons and the daughters let us sing As a closure, um, I just want to read to you the promise in Revelation 21. Luke, God's dwelling place, is now amongst the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Where does this leave you? I hope it leaves you at a life of expectancy for God showing up 
Although you may experience the movements of the body of the snake, know that B-Day is around the corner. Amen. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song Of deliverance from my enemies Till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear And I am a child of God